Amen. As I said, we get to start a new book, and new beginnings are always nice, aren't they? When anyone that is worth their salt has the opportunity, and if you have ever had the opportunity to um, begin a new book, it's a little bit scary in a sense because there's so much there, and there's a lot of preparation ahead of time. But there's a few verses that automatically ought to come into your mind when you're preparing any lesson. Well, let me share one of them. 2 Timothy 2.15, and I think it's up on the screen there for you. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker. There's those guys that go, well, I don't prepare. I just get up there and the Holy Spirit speaks through me. Well, what do you do with this? It says, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. That means that some people ought to be ashamed at their lack of preparation when it comes to the word. And here's the phrase, rightly handling the word of truth. That's a high calling, isn't it? That we rightly handle the word of truth. And then James 3, 1 follows it up with this. Not many of you should become teachers. And some of you are like, whew. <laughs> and trust me, I'm just as floored that the Lord chose me. Trust me. But not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And man, that rattles me. That rattles me in, in, in a good way. Because I realize this is, this is important. And that's God's heart. Because if I become a false teacher, I'm leading you astray. And if you are led astray, you're going to lead others astray. And so a person in that position is going to spend hours reading and rereading the text, breaking it down, determining what sections of thought are there, because they, they don't want to give people too much. Kind of like our meal the other night. We had a wonderful meal, and it just kept coming. It was like, what is going on? I'm drowning in delicious food. But you do. You spend all, there's this, and it's good time, right? It's this wonderful time that you're spending with the Lord. I don't know if you've ever sat down and read a whole book of the Bible, but it can be such a joy when you have the time. Just set yourself aside. Go out on a park bench and read the book of Revelation. Read the book of Titus. Read Leviticus, if you want. But I did something this time that I don't normally do. I listened to a dramatization of the entire book. I studied and I studied. I broke it down. I kind of know that by the end, by Christmas time, we'll be done with this book, which seems like so far away, but it's not. But I listened to it. And, and I was just, I was in tears as I listened to the word of God and as I remembered all these verses that I had read before. But now I'm reading it in context. Let me, let me just give you a little smattering. So if you have your Bible, open it to 2 Corinthians because this is literally a treasure trove. 2 Corinthians, and, and the way Paul writes, I'm an English guy, so I just, I love Shakespearean stuff. I mean, I just, I love language, and I love the writings of Paul. I even love Peter's even more, because you remember that Peter was a fisherman. Where did he learn? Did he didn't go to school for that. Who did that? God. God gave him a gift of writing, and, and we are the benefactors of it. So everybody there at 2 Corinthians, let's start in the beginning there. Look at verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a great verse. You're like, well, that, he writes that all the time. <laughs> no, pause and think about that. Grace, grace, Gentile. Peace, Israelite. The two become one. 
grace to you and peace from God our Father. Our Father. He's your daddy. He's your Abba Father. I mean, what an incredible verse. Then go to verse 7, one that just blessed me so much. Listen to Paul's heart. This is a church that some of them are still rejecting the authority that God had given him to take care of the church, and he loves them. And then later in the book, you'll read of how many beatings and he was shipwrecked and all these things for those people. And yet some still said, nah, he's short. He's ugly. He's not very well spoken. He's not a good orator. You know, one of the most dangerous things is that we look, and they did that in the days of David, right? They're looking at all the brothers and like, man, that guy's tall, dark, and handsome. He ought to be the one. That's the man of God right there. And the prophet was like, "Mm -mm. keep looking. Him, two in line, also tall, handsome, can dunk a basketball backwards. Because that's important, you know, in ministry. <laughs> no, not he, not him. And they get the squeaky little David, freckles, red hair. <laughs> See? Isn't that a blessing? But look what he says in verse 7 of chapter 1 Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. What a great verse. Then flip over to chapter 2. And I want to look at verse 14 through 15. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Always. Always leads us in triumphal procession. We're, of course, going to dig into this when we get there. But I just wanted you to see some of the most spectacular verses in this book. This is what we're going to get to study. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance of death to death. To the other, a fragrance of life to life. Is that a great verse or what? Okay, there's more. Let's look at 5, 517. I bet you know this verse. You might not have known where it was. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, are you in Christ? If Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation the old has passed away behold the new has come wow wow you see what i mean i'm getting emotional now this is the word of god and it's written to us and we get to study it it's going to be an exciting few weeks isn't it verse 21 verse 21 of that same chapter for our sake He made him to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus was sinless. And God made him to be sin for us. The only pure, the only 100% righteous man hung on a cross in your place. And he did it willingly because he loved the Father. And he was obedient to death so that in him we might become. Don't you wish it didn't say might? But you see, you have free will. That we might become. It would be great if it said, we all become. Every one of us. That would be great, wouldn't it? But what a verse. What a verse. Look at six. There's more. And I'm skipping some. Six verse 14. Here's a word for somebody. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That's a word for everybody, actually. Often gets used for, you know, when you're picking your spouse. If you're a believer and they're not, those are two stubborn animals that are going to want to go two different directions and it won't work. But I think he's talking about more. 
To be yoked with somebody means you're connected with them. Wherever they go, you go. Are you yoked with unbelievers? God wants us to be friendly. God wants us to not look at other people outside of the camp and go, you guys are disgusting. No, because that was us. But what, a, what an incredible verse. Let's look at 12.9. Flip over to 12.9. But he said to me, Jesus talking to Paul, Paul who is persecuting Jesus' church. But he said to me, my grace that's Jesus speaking, and he's speaking to you this morning, isn't he? He's saying, my grace is sufficient for you. You don't need anything else. You just need the grace of God. And you've got everything. We're transformed, brothers and sisters. We're transformed. because I mean, it goes on and on. For me, after reading and listening to this, that's what came across. And I understand Paul is writing and he, he, he is defending himself and he's defending his apostleship. I understand that. But as I was reading this, I was just overwhelmed with this thought about the transformed life. I stand before you as one who has been transformed by Jesus Christ. The good things that you see in me, all credit. All glory, all honor go to Jesus Christ because I was a wretch and Christ set me free. He gave me things that I don't have a right to ask for, like a restored, reconciled marriage and beautiful children, breath in my lungs. He gave me you and he gave me to you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the transformed life. Transformed. We see this as we're reading through here. Even some of those verses, think about it. What is a transformed life? What does it look like if I'm living a life that is transformed in Christ? How, how does one live that transformed life? What, what can one expect if I try and live a transformed life in an untransformed world, how might God be wanting to transform me through this trial? We go through trials. God might be wanting to transform you. You see, here's one thing I know. Jesus did not die for you and I to get a nose job or to get a tummy tuck or other such plastic surgery. He died, gave his life so that you could be transformed. I want to go to the best source I know for finding out what words mean. I like to go way back to Webster's original dictionary. You ever seen that? It's amazing, because the coolest thing ever is that he gives scriptural refer references for his definitions. Okay? So 1828, if you're ever wanting to find it, is the Webster's Original Dictionary of 1828. And here's what he says about transformed. To change the form of. To change the shape or appearance to metamorphose as a caterpillar transformed into a butterfly. Does the caterpillar still have a few attributes of that old? Yeah. But it's transformed, isn't it? It used to only be able to crawl on a leaf and then eat it. And then have to go find another leaf because he ate the leaf. But now he's got wings. To change one substance into another, to transmute. The alchemist sought to transform lead into gold, he says. And then he gives a definition for us. He says, in theology, 
the change or to change the natural disposition and temper of a man from a state of enmity to God and his law into the image of God or into the disposition and temper conformed to the will of God. Let me translate that for you. He changes how you think. You thought all about yourself before you came to Christ. Right? You just thought about yourself. You didn't need any classes on self-esteem. The Bible says that we esteem ourselves too highly. And he's saying, your natural disposition is transformed. It changes. Sitting at a dinner table with my dad. I'm recently saved. And he starts on with his Rush Limbaugh stuff. Uh, and I am just like agreeing with him. I'm agreeing with him. I'm like, what, what happened? I'm like, who said that? See, what happened is I had been transformed. The way I once, and I'm not saying that Rush Limbaugh is a sign that you are a believer, okay? <laughs> Please hear me. I'm just saying the way that my dad thought I was so foreign to me. I was fighting with him all the time. That's ridiculous, Dad. You don't know what you're talking about. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, Dad, you've learned a lot in these couple years. <laughs> and then Webster gives a Bible verse for us. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. If we truly follow Jesus, we are going to be transformed, and we are being transformed. You see, it's, it's a done deal, but yet it's also a process. You're still being transformed. Likewise, if there are areas of our life that remain as they were, God wants to change those things. He wants to transform every area of your life. Where you go, what you do, the things that you care about, the things that you don't care about. So let's go back to chapter 1 real quick. And I want to share with you a little bit. I can't share with you everything that I wanted to share with you today because we are getting to sharing communion. But I want to give you a little bit of a historical backdrop of the book. I want to talk to you about the structure of the book. And by looking at the structure, I want to show you why I'm seeing this idea of transformed life. Because I think there's three distinct sections in this book. And I think each of those sections demonstrate to us something about the transformed life. We're going to learn so much through this book. But section one, that's chapters one through seven. Chapters one through seven. And here's what I see there. The transformed life is one that knows, experientially, you know the comfort of God. You are never going to be transformed truly into the image of Christ without discomfort. Section 2 is chapters 8 and 9. There I see the transformed life is marked, is marked by generosity. You're going to see somebody that's transformed. They used to be a tightwad. I mean, the, the Christmas carol story, right? He was transformed. He was a miser. He wouldn't give anybody nothing. And then all of a sudden, I, it's like I got holes in my pockets. That's a transformed life. Because I care about things differently. I see things differently. I'm looking through the lens of my Savior. I'm looking at things eternally rather than temporally. Then section 3, what I see there, that's the last three chapters, chapters 10 through 13. That's where I see the transformed life gives us unshakable hope, but in a particular area reconciliation. 
Be ye reconciled. To be brought back together. Once you were estranged. Once you were at enmity. Because God has given us, as Paul says, he's given us the ministry of reconciliation, hasn't he? And reconciliation ain't easy. Especially if the other person's not for it. But I'll just say this now because it's on my mind. God is for it. He reconciled you to himself. And we are to be ministers of reconciliation. So a little historical background. What we have here is a letter just like the first letter. You know, archaeologists have unearthed thousands, and sometimes they just have them because they didn't have to unearth them, but that's a fun word. They unearthed them. <laughs> but they have thousands of letter, letters from this time period. And the way Paul writes this letter is exactly in line. It's like you and I, when we go through school, you remember that? They would teach you, this is a friendly letter. And so you just say, dear Sally, and then there's a comma, and then you write your letter, and then you sign it, Love, hugs, and kisses. <laughs> or something like that. But then a business letter, well, that's different, right? Business letter's different. You've got to have, it's all, you know, this goes there, this goes there. Don't you use that comma now after you say, dear sir. It's dear sir, colon. Very formatted. And if we're looking at this letter, what was their format? Well, they always started out with a greeting. Who was writing it? We learned that right away. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So it's Paul and Timothy writing this letter. So that is always. And it didn't matter if you were Christian or not. Everyone wrote in this kind of style. There was always this format. And then they would write who they're writing to. Who's this letter addressed to? to the church of God that is at Corinth with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia. So this letter is for the church in Corinth, but it's also for everyone in Achaia, this region. And then there would be a little bit of a greeting. Paul added a little something. Paul would always add a little prayer right at the beginning. That's what he's doing in verse 3. And then he would always end it like we saw we just finished 1 Corinthians and how did that end? Paul was saying, hey, give uh, Fred a high five. Give this, you know, they was like giving greetings. And that's a customary form of the letter. As I said earlier, there were four letters that Paul wrote. We, we learn that because as we read this account and we read the first letter, it's clear that there's something missing. He makes reference to letters, but it can't be this. Basically, what we have, we have first and second Corinthians. We are missing the second letter, and we're missing the fourth. Does that make sense? So there's four letters. We only have two. And we call them first and second. But if we had every one of them, it would be first, second, third, and fourth. Is that clear as mud now? Okay. But here's what we know. As we studied 1 Corinthians, and we remember that, right? You remember what Paul was doing. You remember why. Somebody wrote him a letter. Somebody snitched. Snitches get stitches. Wrong. Snitches are to be commended. Something was wrong in the church. If something is wrong biblically, you need to bring it forth. And so they did. Their hearts hurt for the church and said, Paul, there's stuff going on in this church. I don't think it's right. It doesn't. Something's wrong here. It's not healthy. And so... 1 Corinthians was largely corrective, right? Paul was trying to correct these different things. There was factions. There was sexual immorality. There was disorder in the church services. People were getting drunk during communion. And Paul's like, what are you guys doing? Paul is basically writing them a love letter, though. And, and that's the hard part, isn't it? When we have something right to say, but saying it in love. Saying it with a voice that God would say it in. Adopting his tone. So he writes him this love letter and he says basically to the effect, I, I plead with you. You are defaming 
God's name. See, God's instrument in this world, the pillar of truth in this world is the church. I love the church. Paul loved the church. And we, we understand the church is in a building. The church is the people. We're committed here at Calvary Chapel Bellevue to not be concerned about numbers. We are not concerned at all whether or not we become 500 or 2,000. The only way we want that to happen is if those same 2,000 people are growing deeply in love with Jesus Christ. Because there's packages out there for $2.99. You can get them. This is how you make your church grow. But if you make it, you're going to have to manage it. I'd rather let Jesus build his church, right? But Paul writes this letter. Imagine it was hard, right, to write that letter. That was not fun. It is not fun confronting. I mean, some people are good at it. Some people have, I don't think it's a gift, but they probably think they have the gift of confronting others. It, it's a difficult thing. But Paul needed to do that. And so he wrote this letter. And he and he's hoping for a good result. And then he sees Titus. And Titus says, hey, listen, a lot of the people in the church, I just came from there, a lot of the people in the church, they repented. But then he also had to give them the bad news. There's quite a few that are still causing trouble, still causing factions, still involved with sexual immorality, still getting drunk at communion. And so he was excited. And if he was just a performance kind of guy, he would have just stopped, right? Hey, I got 70% 70 70 of them to get turned around. But that's not God's heart. That's not God's heart. He's not willing that any should perish. And we're going to sit around and not share the gospel? Paul shows us. You see, he writes these letters and we can read it, but he demonstrated, he lived his life as he spoke it. Sometimes he would say that his, his letters were written big. And then these people would see this guy who wrote these incredible letters, and he would come up, and he's like, Hi, fellas. <laughs> Do you like my letter? And you, you know, we don't know what he looks like. There's <laughs> theories. But they didn't respect him because of that. I think we're in danger of that in our culture here, aren't we? We like that guy because he makes us smile. He always seems so happy. You know why he's happy? Because he's got your money. Does he care about your soul? That's the kind of pastor you want. You want a pastor like Paul. I want to be a pastor like Paul that even though he's got this mixed report, he is not content with that because there's two or three or a half a dozen people who don't have it. And you know it's not about Paul, right? You know it's not about his authority, and he's on this, you better obey me because I'm the Pope. He's not that attitude. That is not Paul. He's driving them to Jesus. He wants them to be with Jesus. So he must have had a heavy heart. Because if they refuse my authority, if you can't obey those that are in authority over you here, you're probably not listening to God. Jesus, I believe, said something to that effect, didn't he? But his love. You see, that's why he wrote this letter. I want you to understand the purpose and the difficulties of writing a second letter, or a third in this case. Right? It's difficult. But he hears the report, and so part of his purpose is to say, I love you guys. I am so happy for you guys that are 
deciding to, to live for the Lord. Because we can pretend. Let's be honest. We can go to church and pretend. It's easy. It's easier in a big church, isn't it? Well, you could do it here. The transformed life is one that knows the comfort of God experientially. So in chapters 1 through 7, that's what I want you looking for. I want you looking for ways that God is speaking to us about comfort because we live in a comfort-driven society. I'm not comfortable with that. Well, who said anything about your comfort? You see, it's sort of natural, actually. In Eden, were things comfortable? Originally, there was nothing uncomfortable, right? So it's almost like we're trout. In, in our attempts to find comfort, we go and are trying to go back home to this place called Eden. But Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. You see, Paul uses a really cool word, philipsis. Go ahead and say that. It's fun to say. Philipsis. I mean, that's so mean for the person that has a, uh, a lisp. Philipsis. So, right? But here's what that word means. There was a torture, not as bad as the cross, but there was a torture where they would take a person and put them on a cement slab and then start putting pieces of stone or rocks on their chest. I think that's interesting with what goes on with COVID. They would keep doing that and pressing that on the person's chest and they couldn't breathe. And it would just be this gradual torture. That's the picture behind philipsis. That's the word for afflictions. Paul says, you are going to experience afflictions. We are experiencing afflictions. What do we do with that? How, how do we render that in our mind? See, the problem comes when we're being pressed like that to seek comfort from something, anything else other than God. You fill in the blank. We got plenty of ways to make ourselves comfortable. Right? Me and my wife were not getting along too well. And this person over here is so nice. They're always nice to me. I wish my wife could be like this person. <laughs> They're not. And, and even if they are really nice right now, wait until you get in a relationship with them. Relationships are one. Obvious one. I don't like what's going on, so I start doing drugs or I start drinking too much. I mean, the, the list of stuff that we could do to seek comfort the wrong way is huge. And I think God is telling us through this word, there's only one place to truly get comfort. In your time of need, when your life is pressing you down, and the worst has got to be when you're serving the Lord. It's one thing when your life is pressing you down and you're like, man, I'm going to jail because I was drunk driving and they busted me. Well, you're, you're getting the fruit of your own actions, but it's still hard. It ain't easy, but it's even more difficult when that pressure, when that uncomfortable, when that thing is in your life. And you're like, what did I do to deserve this? Listen, to be transformed is to go through uncomfortable. We're going to have communion here in a little bit. My Savior was hung naked on a cross, on a garbage dump outside of the gates. In Hebrews, it says, come outside the camp. That's where Jesus was crucified, outside of the city walls. They didn't even let him in to Jerusalem. They crucified him outside because he was just garbage. And they looked upon him and they mocked him. 
Oh, you're a king. And they bashed a crown of thorns into his head. He knows a little something about discomfort. And they put a little peg under his feet so that he could lift up and get, catch a breath to make the torture go on longer. And what did he say to him? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. They don't know what they are doing. God, please, please have compassion on those who are outside. It's uncomfortable to hang out with people that are cussing. I get that. I hear kids cussing all day long, and it hurts. But it's so much worse when they use the Lord's name in vain. Oh, it's physically painful. But what a privilege, honestly. And if you've experienced Philipsis, you understand God's comfort. Because who's right there with you? Who promised to never leave you or forsake you? Jesus. And how are you going to know that's true unless you go through something? And how are you going to have compassion for this person who is now going through what you were going through? You see, that's what our grief groups are about. Man, we remember those first days you couldn't even think. And people had to think for us. Do you want to do this or this? I have no idea. I don't even know where I am. But now... Because I've experienced the comfort from Christ, I get to give that to somebody else. See, the Christian life is not about me. It's about you. And from your perspective, it's not about you. It's about that other person. So let's get comfortable with that idea. The transformed life is marked by generosity. All sin is selfishness, isn't it? Daffy Duck, you remember him? That great theologian? I'm so glad for my childhood. I didn't have to watch these crazy cartoons. I don't, I don't even know what they're doing and saying. But back in our day, we had real cartoons. But Daffy Duck, you'll remember, he's with bugs, and there's like, I should have taken the right turn of Al Al Albuquerque. You remember that one? And he, he winds up in a cave, and they look, and there's all this treasure. And Daffy Duck goes out of his mind, and he starts bat he's stepping on Bugs Bunny's head, and he's like, mine, 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 down, down, down. He's like trying to get him back down in the hole so he can have all that treasure. What does it gain a man to gain the whole world? and yet lose his soul. Generosity. We have some generous people in this church, as we said last week. And I don't know if you were here. If you weren't, I'm going to share it again because it's just awesome. Because we had another financial meeting, and we had yet another month where we received more tithes this month than what we budgeted. And that means we're being able to save because the Lord might just have a place for us. We don't know where it is yet, but we believe we have our own place. Wouldn't that be great? I love this place. But remember that God loves a cheerful giver, right? What's the opposite of that? A Scrooge, right? And how does God feel about that person? Well, he probably loves the person but doesn't like his behavior. Section three, I just, Paul, what a heart. I, it had to hurt because he knew the calling that God had placed. He had seen Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He saw the risen Lord. He had every right to the apostleship. But it's more than that just loved. You ever loved and loved and loved on a person and then you just get nothing in return? But Paul teaches us to have an unshakable hope. 
that someday, possibly, God could bring that person back into your life. That there could be a moment where both people just go, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. God died for us so that we we could get along and be together and be unified, and something has driven a wedge between us. You ever had an experience where that's happened and you have no idea what you did? That's cause for prayer, isn't it? Lord, please help me. Help me to love this person. And then if you ever make it possible for reconciliation, I'm all in. I'm all in. Because that's what you're about, Lord. You're about reconciliation. But you see, you're really not going to get to that place until you go through the other things until you're transformed, if you're not renewing your mind, if you're, you're not allowing the trials in your life to produce the fruit that God is intending, if you, you cut bait and you run away, you're not going to get to this place where you are open and ready for reconciliation. Is there someone, before we come to the communion table, is there someone in your life that you've been thinking about for all the time I've been saying reconciliation. Benny, can I share for a second? I haven't seen Benny in months. He's just a dear friend of mine. Two weeks ago, maybe three now, his sister contacted me. He hasn't seen his sister in 15 years. And so I finally see Benny and I go, oh, I got some good news for you. Your sister's looking for you. Wow. And he burst. He had to leave (laughs) because he just was so emotional. That's reconciliation. You remember when you and Jesus got together? Do you remember that? Wonderful. So, gentlemen, if you guys would bring the communion elements and pass those out, I'll go ahead and pray for us. Father, we thank you. Lord, we we didn't even really get into the verse by verse of this book and we're already wrecked (laughs) in a good way. Lord, thank you for the comfort. And help us not to be stingy with that comfort. Help us to be looking for you to redeem the things that have gone on in our lives that were bad and you turn them out for good. Father, I just ask you that you would bless our time as we share in communion. I got one, brother. (laughs) And Father, we thank you that you are teaching us to be generous. And Lord, we thank you also that... uh, that you are a God of reconciliation and you've called us to this ministry. If somebody comes and asks us, what's our, what's our ministry? We can say it's reconciliation. So Lord, I pray for our time sharing in your communion that we remember these things about you, that you are generous, that you are a reconciler and that no matter what discomfort comes in our lives, Lord, you are able to redeem it. In Jesus' name, amen. So hold on.